Well, thank you very much, and it is wonderful to see so many people together on uh, Friday afternoon who are interested in, in food. Um, those of us at the School of Public Health are looking at food uh, very intensively. We have been for many years, and uh, this is basically through the lens of how does food affect health. That's probably most, uh, the, the most fundamental question we have, specifically how, how different foods affect health differently. Uh, if, if we're going to have policies around food or uh, for uh, they may be national policies, international policies, or whether we're giving dietary guidelines about food choices, it's really fundamentally important to have the best possible information about how our dietary choices affect our long-term health and well-being. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's an important question. It's not so always straightforward to answer that question. Um, ideally, we would conduct large randomized trials to address every question we have, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, what is the optimal egg consumption, what is the optimal trans fat uh, consumption, but for practical reasons, those kinds of randomized trials are often uh, very difficult logistically and and to conduct and often infeasible. Uh, but when they can be conducted, the worst aspect of randomized trials is that they can often give totally misleading answers, mainly because it's very difficult to assure that individuals uh, maintain the diet to which they're assigned for many years, especially if you're conducting studies on the scales of tens of thousands of people, which you need to look at some of these items, some of these questions. So the next best kind of information will usually be large prospective studies where people are eating the diets they choose, but we measure and track their diets over time and look at their diets uh, in relation to health outcomes. Uh, if that information in combination with short-term intervention studies, controlled feeding studies that last two or three weeks with a few dozen people looking at biochemical or physiological changes, that combination of these short-term controlled feeding studies and long-term cohort studies in most cases will probably be the best available evidence that we'll be able to have on the relationship between aspects of diet and health outcomes. So our group has invested uh, much of its information, uh, much of our effort for the last almost 40 years uh, looking at diet and health in large cohort studies. The first was a nurse's health study, 121,000 women who were enrolled in 1976, and we started collecting dietary data in 1980 using st detailed, standardized, and validated uh, questionnaires. And we've uh, very importantly updated dietary intake over time uh, to account for people's individual changes, uh, choices in their diet, and also the fact that the food supply is continually evolving over time. Along the way, we've collected uh, uh, blood samples uh, and toenails for, for biomarkers. Uh, the uh, Nurses Health Study included only women, so we added 52,000 men as a health professional's follow-up study. And to look at diet earlier in life, we added the Nurses Health Study to another 116,000 women. Uh, and I want to point out that this is the work of a large number of people, uh, many, or some of whom I've, I've listed at the bottom here, but there are many other people who have contributed importantly to this work over time. So we're tracking diet over time, and we're also essentially tracking incidence of basically all major diseases that occur in this population. Uh, just to give a few examples, and we've published uh, many hundreds of papers looking at uh, specific, specific aspects of diet and uh, different health outcomes. Uh, this is looking at uh, risk of coronary heart disease as a function of different types of dietary fat. And uh, this is based on 14 years of follow-up, 1980 to 1994. Uh, during that time, about 1,000 women died of coronary heart disease or were hospitalized for acute myocardial infarction. And we're looking here at uh, different increasing energy from different types of fat uh, uh, controlling for total energy intake. And uh, as uh, I've, uh, done, uh, we've done in all the slides I show, we've adjusted very carefully for smoking, physical activity, and other variables that could be confounding. So what it shows is by far the worst type of, of fat was trans fat, 
uh, saturated fat compared to carbohydrate. The comparison here was minimally related to risk of heart disease, but mono and polyunsaturated fat were related to reduced risk of heart disease. We can also look uh, not just at nutrients, but also the basic foods and food groups that people consume. So this is looking at substitution of one major protein source for another in relation to risk of coronary heart disease, here based on 26 years of follow-up. Uh, and uh, the main message is at the bottom there, if you want to reduce heart disease, it's replacing red meat with poultry, fish, nuts, or, uh, or beans, uh, or some combination of those, presumably not just uh, one of those. Uh, this is a similar kind of analysis looking at type 2 diabetes. Uh, whether it's uh, nuts, low-fat dairy, uh, whole grains, poultry, or fish, all of those are associated with lower uh, risk if they replace red meat in the diet. Uh, I could go on with lots of other examples, but just to give an idea of another kind of way of looking, this, uh, looking at outcomes, this is looking at the, per the percent of avoidable coronary heart disease by adopting a whole package of healthy lifestyles, including not smoking, uh, avoiding overweight or obesity, uh, incorporating moderate to vigorous activity, and a healthy diet, and we create, uh, whoops, created a dietary score here based on uh, uh, trans fat, cereal fiber, glycemic load, high polyunsaturated to saturated fat ratio, and also moderate alcohol consumption. So the bottom line was that we could prevent potentially 92% of, this is type 2 diabetes, uh, uh, in the population of the nurses' health study if everybody adopted this healthy diet and lifestyle package. So the potential for prevention of chronic disease uh, is, is huge. This is uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. We see about 80% potential reduction of coronary heart disease and very high percentages of uh, some cancers as well. But uh, very few people are adopting this the full package uh, even though it's actually pretty reasonable. Uh, in this uh, particular analysis, analysis, only about 4% of our participants had adopted that uh, package of healthy lifestyle variables, even though it seemed pretty moderate. So there's a, we have a lot more work to do identifying all of the health effects of different aspects of diet. Uh, we've done a lot, but there is also a huge gap between what we know and what is possible to do in terms of disease prevention by healthy diet. Oh, thank you.